Hello there. Um, before we start uh, the event, I'm just going to go through uh, a few uh, house rules um, just so everyone knows how to use the software. Um, we want to obviously make it as interactive as possible. So the first step is if you make your screen uh, larger so you can see the screen and uh, the panelists. So if you do that now and if you do that at the bottom right hand screen, Thank you very much. Uh, and this is probably the most uh, important uh, step. This is how to ask questions to our panelists. So um, as you can see on the right hand side, there is a question mark button. If you click on that, you can ask as many questions as you like throughout the whole session. Um, so please uh, ask as many questions as possible and uh, my colleague Phil will chair the event and, and send the questions uh, to the panellists. And uh, that uh, is is that. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Phil who will um, introduce the, the panellists. But please use that feature for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, and uh, good morning to everyone, and welcome to the latest of Curtin Co's regionally focused online events, where we discuss development-related matters with the involvement of stakeholder guests, and today we turn our attention to the county of Oxfordshire. Now, reconciling the demand for new housing numbers, supporting infrastructure against development sensitivities, particularly around Greenbelt land, local plans, not to mention the climate emergency and the imperative to reach net zero carbon. These are things that political, community and development professionals are grappling with in local authority areas up and down the country. And I should know, my name is Phil Cawthorn. I've been a councillor in Hillingdon for the last 28 years, including 18 years as a cabinet member, chiefly with responsibility for housing and adult services. But I'm not wearing that hat today, of course. As Associate Director with Curtin & Co, my job and that of my colleagues is to work with communities and stakeholders to ensure that they are able to help shape and benefit from local development proposals, very much in the spirit of localism. And we're delighted to have with us this morning, Councillor Liz Lefman, who has recently become leader of Oxford County Council following the May local elections with the county in no overall control. Now Liz leads an administration of Liberal Democrat Green and Labour Party members. Liz was first elected to the County Council in 2017 and she has run her own business with her husband since 1992. She was also a founder director of South Hill Star, a community solar farm built outside Charlbury in 2017, which now produces enough renewable energy just about to serve the needs of the town. So very impressive too. It can't quite feed into the grid, I gather, at the moment. Liz has said of her the administration that she leads, the main difference between this and the previous one is that this is very much an alliance between three different parties that are bringing their own interests and skills to the table. So they're very collegiate. Um, thank you, it's great to have you here. Uh, bringing a planning perspective to this discussion, I'm also delighted to have with us Stephen Sensigal, who is a partner and head of planning for the South and West uh, for Carter Jonas. Stephen needs a team of 20 planning and development professionals working for a variety of public and private sector clients for whom the firm provides planning and development consultancy services on a national basis. Stephen is also an equity partner and the Oxford head of office. He appears regularly at planning inquiries and development plan examinations in public, both as an advocate and as an expert witness, and is a frequent speaker on planning matters. So, uh, eminently uh, suitable for the conversation we have today. We look forward very much to your input too, Stephen. We've already had the plug for questions. Do do please ask as many as you can, and we'll cover as many as we can in the time we've got available. And without any further ado, I will pass straight on to Liz. Liz, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, very nice to be here. I'm very pleased to be able to showcase um, our new alliance, which is really important to me uh, as leader. Um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, as Phil said in May, uh, we had our local elections and it became very apparent that there was no single party um, that was able to form um, an administration. Um, the Conservatives having lost around eight seats to us, 
Um, and so we made an alliance, first of all, with the Green Party, who had gained several seats, um, which put us up to 24 councillors. But then we also needed to be able to form a partnership with Labour in order to put an administration together. So we had a week of heavier, heavier negotiations with Labour. Um, and we came to a conclusion that we did actually share a lot of values and that we could work together. And so we now have a cabinet which has been formed between the three parties. Um, and we're working very well together at the moment. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we have been able to put a lot of our differences aside, um, recognising that we have more in common than we have that divides us. So that's really important. And it's, it's meant that we've made a really good start. Um, but moving on from the sort of political landscape, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what our priorities are, which do have quite an impact when it comes to planning and infrastructure. Because we have said that we want to put at the centre and front of everything that we do, at the heart of everything we do, we want to tackle the climate emergency. Uh, and we have adopted the um, principles of the um, Climate and Emergency Bill, which is at the moment making its way slowly through Parliament, um, as the principles that we will adopt as a council. And this means that we are looking at um, decarbonising as quickly as we possibly can across the county. Obviously, that's going to include things that we can do ourselves as county. Um, but as my um, cabinet member put it the other day, um, whatever we do at the county ourselves, in other words, whatever the organisation does, it really only amounts to the equivalent of 300 homes. So actually, the challenge is to change the way that we do things um, as a population to try and convince people that they must move out of their petrol or diesel driven cars into either electric cars or onto public transport or adopt active travel as a means of getting around. So modal shift is absolutely fundamental to all of this. And in order to achieve that, we have to make some really big changes to infrastructure. And that's where planning and infrastructure really comes in. So at the moment, we're looking at a number of projects which we are working on. Um, I was in a meeting earlier this morning, for example, um, which is a pre-meeting before um, my first meeting of the board of the North Cotswold line, uh, where we're looking at how we can um, increase the number of um, the number of trains running through the north northern part of the county. Uh, but we also are looking at ways in which we can get people onto trains or something like light rail across the southern part of the county uh, of the district of, of um, West Oxfordshire along the A40, for example, so that we can take start to take traffic off, off that very congested road. Um, another aspect of what we're doing is also uh, based on the fact that we now have with the county a partnership with um, Cherwell District Council, which, of course, is the planning district. Um, we have we set up this partnership about four years ago now, uh, three years ago, I think it was. Um, and it was mainly out of ne out of necessity, actually, because Cherwell had previously been partnered with South Northamptonshire. Um, there are quite a lot of these partnerships, as I'm sure you know, going across the county, um, across, across the country. Uh, West Oxfordshire, for example, is in a partnership with some of the Gloucester councils where we share a lot of our officers uh, in an organisation called Publica. So this was a similar sort of setup between South Northampton and Cherwell, which unfortunately had to be broken up because Northamptonshire, you may recall, um, was basically bankrupt um, and had to be formed into two unitaries, which Cherwell couldn't take part in. So we formed a partnership, which means that actually when it comes to things like planning and infrastructure, we're now able to work together. We have direct a directorate that covers this whole area of um, planning, um, environment and infrastructure, which he's actually director of for both Cherwell and for Oxfordshire County Council. So we have officers working together on various projects, which I think is really an important step forward. But it also means that we've been able to join together, for example, housing in, in Cherwell with social care in Oxfordshire. Um, and we have a very innovative project going on at the moment um, we, where we are uh, providing extra care housing um, in the county uh, for older people and for, for adults who, who, who um, have disabilities and need that extra care housing. So that's a really important step forward in terms of planning as well. Uh, and the other thing to say also, which I think we can't avoid, is the fact that although there's quite a lot of housing planned for Oxfordshire, we haven't yet got the infrastructure that goes alongside that. That is a big challenge for the county council. There are some projects which we've inherited 
um, bids for money from the Housing Int Infrastructure Fund, um, which are there to support housing in places like Didcot um, and around Ensham. We're not entirely happy with what our predecessors did with that because there's too little emphasis on um, active travel and too much emphasis on cars. Uh, but that's something that we can hopefully modify over the next few months. Um, and also the whole question of affordable housing across the county is a really big elephant in the room. Um, Oxfordshire itself is taking a lot of the um, extra housing from Oxford City Council, which is why places like Ensham are expanding so fast. Um, there is very little affordable housing being built in the city centre at the moment. And one of the challenges for us is to look at how we can um, improve the number of affordable homes, but also make them carbon neutral. And one of the challenges to any council at the moment is how do we work with developers to produce carbon, carbon neutral housing, carbon zero housing, um, because the government legislation doesn't support that at the moment. And not only are we seeing that as a problem with, within Oxfordshire, but also within the wider arc, which stretches from Oxfordshire to Cambridgeshire, uh, and which I, as leader of the council, sit on with other leaders across that area. Um, one of the frustrations for us is that the housing minister is still talking about reducing carbon um, output from homes by 70%, where we believe it actually should be more than that. And there isn't any evidence of government coming forward with legislation to support us in, in, in that principle. So that for us is a bit of a frustration. And I'd be very interested to hear views today about how we get around that, because I do think that if we are going to decarbonise in Oxfordshire and indeed across the country, we need the support of government in, able to, in, in order to be able to make that happen. Um, somebody put it to me, some of the bigger developers um, will continue to build to the standards that they, that, you know, the, the standards that they're allowed to um, within the law. Um, some of the smaller developers may very well want to build to a much higher standard, but they find themselves in a position where they may be outpriced by some of the bigger developers. It's a conundrum that needs to be solved, and it needs to be solved quickly so that we can actually fulfil what we have been elected to do, and which I believe other councils around the country want to do, uh, which is to support an, a, a, a decarbonised future. So very interested to hear other views on this. I think I've probably taken up my 10 minutes. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to more questions and comments. Liz, thank you very much indeed for uh, setting this thing so beautifully, beautifully for our discussion uh, today. Um, I mean, I think there are um, challenges out there for the development industry in some of what you said there, and certainly to central government in terms of decarbonisation. We'll see where that discussion takes us. Can I just say on a personal note, from for what it's worth, the thought of being in no overall control is far, far worse than the reality. It does work. I had eight years of it. The sky doesn't fall in and actually it makes people work together. So I wish you all the very best with that. Um, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Stephen now to uh, uh, make his comments and we'll, we'll take the discussion from there. But thank you very much indeed. Stephen, over, over to you, please, if you would. Uh, good, good morning, Phil. Um, a, a lot to cover there, but again, just introducing my, myself briefly. Uh, so I'm Head of Planning and Development at Carter Jonas for the South and Southwest. Um, I have a team of 20 odd people based in Oxford. Um, our work takes us across the South and Southwest, but also I'm working currently in Kent, I'm working in Suffolk, I'm working in London, I'm working in Wales, I'm working up in Yorkshire. So we we have a, a wide remit along with our other offices uh, with, within the Clark Jonas um, business. Uh, I've been in practice as a town planner in Oxfordshire for 30 odd years. Um, previously with a firm called Kemp and Kemp, and then for the last four years or so with Carter Jonas. So I've seen a lot of change uh, in that time. Uh, when I started, it was a much simpler time in planning terms, uh, but Oxfordshire was very much a a county of restraint uh, through its structure plans and its local plans. It was about containing and, and, and minimizing development. We've seen a sea change, I think, uh, over the last 10 years or so uh, with the growth deal and, and, and so on. Uh, and it's exciting to hear what Liz says in terms of, I think, understanding that there has to be some growth uh, throughout the county. It's a very exciting county in terms of employment provision, uh, science and innovation, uh, but we do have a housing problem in the county, and it, and it is a conundrum as to how we balance the need for housing against the need to protect the environment, the need to provide sufficient housing for those wishing to work and live in the county. 
Um, I'm involved in strategic housing sites in each of the five districts uh, in Oxfordshire. Uh, I'm doing Pillum Science Village, which is three and a half thousand houses next to Pillum Science Centre. I also act as Science Centre in terms of its development proposals. Uh, I'm doing other large projects in the Vale at Dalton Barracks, uh, in Charwell, um, in uh, West Oxfordshire, at Whitney. So I've got a, a pretty good handle, I think, uh, on how things are going. Um, the biggest problem is infrastructure provision, as Liz has quite rightly pointed out. Um, uh, for example, with, uh, with Cullum Science Centre, we had issues around bringing forward new development there, which is in the national interest in terms of fusion technology, because of a, a complete lack of capacity in the, in the highway network. Um, in that instance, we worked with the County Council very closely. I have to say they were incredibly supportive in un understanding the importance of Cullum and finding a way ar around the short-term problem. We're now anticipating the, the HIF project, uh, which is due to, um, again, for planning, I understand, uh, in August, September of this year, with completion in, 20, in 2024. That should be a game changer for South Oxfordshire, provided it, uh, it, keeps, to, it keeps the planning, keeps to the programme. But until that happens, the housing provision in South Oxfordshire, I think, will be slow in coming forward because there just isn't the, 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 the highway capacity uh, to, to accommodate it. Um, and the same goes elsewhere. We've got issues with the A40 uh, in, in Oxfordshire uh, and the developments in, in Ensham and, and Whitney and further west in Carterton. So but that is a problem. Um, the county council is doing its best to address it, uh, but it's, um, it, it's been a problem for years. And without, I would suggest, more direct government uh, funding, upfront funding, uh, it's difficult to see how that conundrum will go away anytime, anytime soon. Um, other themes that, that Liz picked up on, um, the green economy, climate change. Um, yeah, again, another conundrum. And it'd be interesting to hear people's views this morning. I get the impression from talking to house builder clients that, that they, are, they are starting to see the benefits from a marketing, a marketing perspective. Uh, in uh, addressing uh, the climate change issue, and he's shown that their new homes are sustainable. And that is probably the key to delivery of, 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 a, of a more sustainable future, because if, you know, being frank and cynical about it, if the government can see there is a, a marketing uh, benefit uh, to them in doing this, they'll be more inclined to do it. Uh, but then they, it does come with a cost. You know, it's going to add, I don't know, 5,000 or so to. Uh, house building costs in terms of providing uh, heat pumps. Um, there's the whole issue around biodiversity offsetting, what that does in terms of, uh, uh, of the cost of providing that offsite. People are saying it could be 20k a hectare to, uh, to, to, to deliver that, all of which will affect uh, the viability of, of new housing developments uh, and might well restrict supply in that landowners will say, well, the price getting for our land is a lot less than it was, it was a few years ago, so we'll let's just hold off and see how things settle down. So another conundrum in terms of uh, the need for and provision of housing in a timely in a timely fashion. Um, I could go on, but I'm, I, I suspect I'm still in the thunder of those that want to contribute to this uh, this seminar. So I, I'll I'll stop there uh, and finish to hear what people have to say. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. And you've, uh... Hopefully you can hear me. You've uh, set out there, uh, I think, very thoroughly the sort of full gambit of issues that are associated with this and some of the challenges for the development industry uh, and for central government uh, as well. Um, and questions are starting to come in. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit cheeky as chairman of the full rank. And uh, I, I put up the one because I was very really encouraged this with what you were talking about with the work with Cherwell District Council sounds really encouraging. Certainly the job I'm in, my, my, my councillor role, uh, has sort of taught me an appreciation of the simplicity of the unitary authority. Uh, obviously, that's not what you have in Oxfordshire, multi-tiered local authority area. And whilst I'm encouraged by what I hear, uh, it does strike me as from the outside looking at it as being somewhat unwieldy. I wonder if you share that. What are your initial impressions and perhaps what are the opportunities to perhaps make it work better? Uh, because don't forget you're responsible for social care, you know, transport, school places, and yet the planning authorities, the districts. 
So that leads to work well in the context of all this. I just wonder what, what your thoughts are initially on that, if you would please. Yeah, a good question. I mean, as I said before, this was thrust upon us rather than something that we chose. Um, and there have been some very definite advantages, as I think I said earlier, about you know being able to bring housing together with social care, so that you've got um, more, you, you can you can build those um, those those sorts of projects that that will will benefit some of the most vulnerable people in the county. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, it, it's unwieldy in the sense that first of all, we're only doing it with one district. Um, that's that's a big difference from having a unitary where you're actually working as one team and it's still very much a sort of you know them and us partnership in the sense that you know we don't have very much to do with the councillors although we share the officers and I think mm -hmm. actually I mentioned publica as well um, which is, is slightly different but it, 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 as a, as a councillor on West Oxfordshire District Council I find it frustrating that I don't e I don't even know anymore who the planning officers I need to speak to actually are because they're not based in West Oxfordshire anymore so while there are some advantages in in creating larger areas um, large that, that are unitary authorities um, actually what we're doing at the moment is a bit piecemeal to be honest um, and I think it is it, it it will get easier I think as we settle down into the whole thing but yes it, it's a complicated setup uh, and one that was, as I say, born out of necessity rather than out of a, a, a sort of sense of, you know, where we were going. But one thing we have tried to do, um, and we've we've suggested this since we became the administration, um, is that at the moment, um, county council officers, because they also happen to be Cherwell district council officers, are briefing district council officers in Cherwell, but not briefing people in West or South or Vale. Uh, and we want that to be more inclusive so that we actually do get better communication between the various districts and the county council so that when it comes to new projects such as the ones that we've been talking about um, we can we can start to build those more effectively together i think it's it is important that you have that communication and the other thing also to say is this um it, it, the, you may be aware that there's been um, you know, an area action plan going through at the moment on, on Salt Cross outside Ensham, which is the garden village, which is going to be a very big new garden village. Um, and there's been some discussion around the responsibilities and how they break down in terms of how some of the access points work, you know, whether it's the planning authority that needs to look at this, whether it's the highways authority, it all has to fit in with the HIF 2 that is 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 improvement which you know is, is all the improvements to the a40 it's very complicated at the moment because you've got two authorities that are trying to work together but at the same time you know the finance for the hif which is going to make hopefully things on the a40 a little easier means that we're we're having separate discussions with other people about maybe putting a light rail or a train station in it's just bringing all those things together that is so complex so it's, you know, it's not an ideal situation. I don't know whether a unitary would actually work in Oxfordshire because of the fact that the city um, is such a big part of the county. You've got this kind of donut around the city. I know it works in some authorities. It works quite well in places like um, Wiltshire, actually, where you've got Swindon and then the rest of the county. And maybe that's the model that we need to use going forward. But I do think bringing people together and having them uh, look at the problems as a whole as a, in, in the round, rather than you know planners on one side and highways management on the other that has to be a better way forward thank, thank you Lisa. You, you almost anticipated the supplementary about going down the unitary route like your neighbours buckinghamshire of course uh, uh, one size doesn't fit all uh, well yes no. we Fine. may actually end up having to do that as a matter of fact because i had a letter from mchlg the other day saying um you need to decide what you want to do about this they're bringing that back and um, there was a letter a few months uh, before the pandemic actually they started looking at that and it may well be that we need you know we'll start to think about going down that route but i'm not quite sure how it's going to look at the moment indeed indeed a big topic for another day i'm sure Stephen, i wonder if i can just put that to you i mean you, you deal with all the authorities up and down the country union trees multi-tiered is there a big difference um would it make a difference in, in an Oxfordshire context do you think or how do you see that i think liz touched on the biggest problem is is oxford city uh, i i get the impression that they uh, are, are not at all keen on the unitary idea um it might work to have the, the sort of the, the donuts approach with all the district authorities joining forces um yeah there are there are problems sometimes in uh 
especially in, in, in big projects where you're trying to bring together um, the, the county council from a highways perspective, an education perspective, district officers from the, from the sort of planning side and landscape and so on and so forth. Uh, having a more joint approach is probably on balance the, the better approach. My concern though is does it become too big and unwieldy? Um, and does it just create um, more bureaucracy that, um, that doesn't actually in reality speed things up? Because that the essence of all this is, is trying to bring forward development in a timely fashion uh, and in effect in effective fashion. Uh, and to deal with all the environmental issues and, and, and so on that, we, that we've talked about. Um, it's a conundrum, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer is. I, I, do, I do like the idea of the Oxfordshire plan, which for those of a certain age is in effect an old structure plan, uh, although it goes further than an old structure plan in, in many respects, but it, it deals with more than just strategic planning. But it, it's good to have that, that county-wide um, take on on matters uh, and that does go to being more joined up but you know it's easy to write the plan uh, implementing the plan is another kettle of fish altogether so i would add that actually um you mentioned the growth board um stephen earlier on when you were speaking um we actually have renamed the growth board it's no longer called, called the growth board because we felt that gave the wrong impression because people think of it as just you know houses 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 um we've called it um, the future Oxfordshire partnership because we want to get the message across that actually it's not just about building houses it's actually about creating um, a, a green future for the, for the economy and a green economy but a green future for everybody in the county um, and actually that's quite a powerful way of being able to bring districts and county together uh, and to look at those projects in the round um, so that I think can be more effective as we go as we go forward it can be used more effectively my only issue with the growth board is um, electability, as it, as, it, as it were. You know, it's it's an amalgam of uh, of members from the different authorities, but uh, where's their clear mandate? Where, where, where's that? Where's that organisation's clear clear planning and development mandate? Um, which is a slight issue. It has to ultimately go back to the districts and to the county council. Yeah. Absolutely, um, it can't be delegated to the growth board but I think having that conversation is really important yeah Indeed. but yeah the conversation is very important it's but it, it's whether or not as a is it as is it a, a private mechanism to bring forward development again in a timely fashion um because of that turning and throwing and that political tension sometimes between different authorities thank you that, you're, that, you're, that, you're that, on uh, I'm not now, hopefully. Yeah, you should be able to hear me. Um, yeah, and I suppose that, that quite a little debate there around this question of unitary, isn't it? If we're not unitary, how can, how can it be made to work better? It sounds like you're, you're taking a really studied, serious and considered approach to this in, in Oxfordshire, and I wish you well. And certainly we will see how things develop moving forward. Uh, one or two other questions have been filtering in, and that, which I will run past you. I'll try and bring a couple of them together. Um, there's a question about housing delivery in Oxfordshire uh, being slow generally, especially on allocations. Um, how, how can you perhaps help from within the LPA to move that forward? And also the question of transport, and you touched on infrastructure. Transport is a hot topic. How would you increase the quality and transport, uh, chronic quality of transport and reduce reliance on cars? Do you have any thoughts on that as well? Um, one thing we are about to put together is an enhanced partnership with the bus companies, so that's going to make quite a big difference, I think. Um, and we are also looking at um, projects which will bring um, electric buses into the city. Um, and there's a big project that, um, that, that we're looking at that will, will also um, hopefully bring um, much more in the way of um, uh, connectivity with active travel. So that we can actually get people from that. What, what, we, what we want to do, and this is a want, it's not something that's going to happen immediately, but one of the things we absolutely want to happen on transport is to make it attractive for people and sensible for people to use public transport. One of the problems that we had a few years ago, as I'm sure you know, is that bus, bus subsidies had to be cut. And a lot of buses in rural areas particularly um, had to be, basically went to the wall. Um, so one of, one of the objectives that we have in putting together this new bus partnership um, is, is to make it possible for us to find ways in which we can provide 
transport which makes sense. In other words, I've got a bus that runs through my town. It used to run on an hourly timetable. So you could get the bus to work and you knew when it was going to arrive and you knew when it was going to come home again. Now it runs on a very erratic timetable because the bus companies had to basically cut its cloth according to the amount of you know, subsidy it was getting. And that means that you can find that you go into, as it might be Whitney, you get there, you do your shopping, and then you've got a three hour wait. And the whole of the middle of the day, no buses. Um, and you cannot guarantee that, you know, you just don't, you can't, you've got to have the timetable in front of you to know when the bus is going to go. So it's things like that, that we really have to tackle, I think, to make it easier for people to use public transport. But it's not just that either. I think it's about finding ways in which we can encourage people to, um, to, to, to cycle to transport hubs. Um, the, the Salt Cross plan, I keep coming back to that, but that actually is quite important because that's going to be based around um, people being able to access, for example, Hanborough's, Hanborough Station uh, using, uh, using, a, using um, their cycles. Um, so I think those are the sorts of things that you will see emerging as time goes by from this administration. Uh, we will be focusing on things like that. And just going back to the first, um, the first question, can you just remind me what the first question was, Phil? It, it was about, um, sorry, you're muted again. Well, it was to do with housing delivery across Oxfordshire uh, being slow, uh, and there's been yes, what done of it. To, to sort of speed that up. I don't know is the answer. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, I, I know the government thinks that if they, you know, change the planning laws, it'll all happen, but it, it, it won't because I'm. It, it it's not. The, I don't think it's the process. Um, the process of actually going through planning partly slowed down by the fact in Oxfordshire that we actually don't have as many planners as we need. Um, that's partly to do with the fact that they're being offered jobs elsewhere at a higher rate of pay. They're being given attractive options in other parts of the, of the country or, or with other with other organisations. You know, they, they've got a skill and they, they naturally want to work for the best, best for the best salary they can get. So we are very short of planners and that does slow things down. So it's actually, I think, putting money into making sure that we can retain good planners. That's part of it. I don't believe that the problem is the slowness of the planning process per se, but I do think there has been a slowdown, um, partly due to the fact that developers have got the land, they've got the planning permission, and they're not entirely sure where things are going. The pandemic has undoubtedly slowed things down quite a lot. And before that, I think part of the problem was simply the price of housing in Oxfordshire. And I keep coming back to the fact that we really do need to do something about um, providing affordable housing in, in, in larger numbers than we are able to at the moment. Um, and the other thing, and, and this is a purely political thing, I do think that the importance of social housing has been overlooked by the government. Um, being able to offer people a decent home that they don't necessarily have to pay for, but perhaps can get on the ladder through some of the, you know, the, there have been projects, but very small scale um, of joint ownership of housing, things like that. We have to be much more creative about things like that if we want to um, get people into new homes. Um, so there are a number of things that we could do, but I don't think there's a single, a single answer to that question, unfortunately. In terms of um, shortage of plans, yes, I can identify that my own local authority, and many of them do train up as town planners and, and, and go to work in the private sector. So I, I, and in fact, that leads to one of the questions we've got about uh, perhaps uh, developers not getting uh, speedy responses from uh, planning departments. And I guess that, that's all very much at, at the heart of it, really, uh, is. Um, Stephen, I wonder if you just, just bounce that last question off you, really. We were talking about uh, transport, what we can do about that to reduce dependence on cars and generally speed up housing delivery. Did you have any thought to add to what, to what Liz has said on that? Yeah, before I do that, just on the, on the developers uh, being slow, bringing sites forward point, I, I, I don't think they are. You know, they, if, you, if you drive around Oxfordshire, there's a heck of a lot of new building going on. Uh, uh, where things are held up, I think it is, as I said before, primarily about infrastructure provision, uh, meaning that they, they just can't get on site. It is about uh, a, res a resourcing issue within local authorities. I mean, we, uh, I had a situation recently with an authority, I won't mention the name, where I chased and chased somebody I know quite well, senior officer, um, for his sponsors, and he was just absolutely slowed under. And it wasn't his fault, but he just didn't get back to me. It's a site that's allocated, he wants to help, 
but he was just slow under. Um, and I do accept that people like me keep pinching people from low courage as well, which doesn't doesn't always help. But um, in terms of transport provision, um, it goes to where development uh, is is located. It goes to how convenient it is and how viable it is to provide um, public transport facilities. Um, I mentioned previously Cullum Science Centre. One of the things we did there to, to bring forward development uh, quickly uh, ahead of the, the HIF works was to pay money through 106 obligations uh, for new uh, bus services uh, to serve to serve Cullum, but also we made sure that those services serve the wider community and there's been a significant benefit in that east-west a415 corridor between Abingdon uh, and on to Barrensfield and to Wallingford and down to Didcot through investment that UK AA has been able to make through 106 obligations uh, to serve its needs but also to provide that, that wider benefit. Um, I think in terms of new development, yes, it, it, it is making sure that we build in from the very outset public transport provision. Uh, that's about where you locate the development. Again, I mentioned Cullum Science Village to the west of Cullum Science Centre. There's a railway station there, which is a fantastic starting point because you know getting new railway stations is very hard, it takes a very long time, it's very, very expensive. Locating the development where there are existing provisions makes it much, much easier. Um, and you know, the whole autonomous vehicle um, debate, um, there, there's talk about a link between Harwell and Cullum. We, we act for Harwell. Uh, they're very keen to see that happen, as is Cullum. Um, uh, Harwell is also investing in bus provision. You know, it's, it's down to, I think, again, the partnership between the private sector and the public sector to invest the money wisely and in the right locations in a way which benefits not only the employer, if it's an employment site, uh, or the, 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 the developer, if it's a housing site, but also that, that wider community. Stephen, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm conscious of time getting on a little bit. We've got a few more questions. Let's try and get through as many as we can. Um, I've got one here. Um, right, we've spoken a lot about the green agenda. We've spoken a lot about climate. There's a comment here about new builds having better eco standards, being much more energy efficient, and um, how will existing stock be improved? I wonder what your thoughts are about that in this context. Uh, Liz, could you perhaps have a go at that one? Well, I, I, I touched on this earlier when I said that I, I, I think the government needs to do something about legislating, uh, uh, certainly as far as the standards of new builds are concerned, um, and you know, um, legislating to make sure that when houses are built, they have um, uh, heating systems that are compatible with, uh, with low carbon. Um, but the problem, the really big problem, is going to be retrofitting existing housing stock. And it, I mean, there have been attempts in the past through things like the Green Deal to offer people money to try and do that, but it hasn't worked. And I think that is a big, big issue that we're all gonna to have to face um, very soon. But what if, if the government could get that right, um, there are, there's a huge potential for jobs, massive potential for jobs, which I think we would all want to see. Now, um, but, it, but it's, it's a complicated business getting that sorted out. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, actually, about um, where, where the, the, the heat pumps might come from. And apparently there are companies in the UK that are manufacturing them. I think there's a big manufacturing plant down in Cornwall, which is manufacturing heat pumps, where apparently um, the cost of manufacturing it is about the same as it would be even if you gave it to China to do, because there's relatively little labor involved in it. The labor is actually in the retrofitting itself, which I think would be great from our point of view if we could get that up and running. Um, but we do need government support for that because unfortunately as a local authority, we just haven't got the money to be able to do that ourselves and neither have the district councils, but it is absolutely vital that we are focused on that. Um, so, yeah, I'm afraid I can't give you a very satisfactory answer at the moment, except to say I'm absolutely conscious of the need to do all of that. Indeed, it's something we're all grappling with, uh, those of us in local government, but certainly, um, I'm, uh, in part of the answer to your question earlier, Liz, you asked about what's happening in terms of lobbying. There's a huge amount going on through the local government association, I dare say, or involved in that and part of it. So uh, we work at that uh, and we, we keep going. Um, Stephen, any thoughts on the on, on the um, retrofitting 
bit, the sort of interesting stock, how we approach that? Um, it can only be, I think, through government intervention. It's not, it's not a sort of a planning and development issue per se. Uh, it's a, it's a wider economic and social and environmental issue. Uh, um, you know, in terms of new development, standards are changing, uh, and I think the, the development industry is is geared up for that uh, and will respond positively. Uh, but yeah, if you think about the existing housing stock, that that's a far far bigger problem, uh, and uh, and one that. Yeah, it's got to be government led. I think um, we've uh, lost Phil. Uh, um, uh, David, I'm here. No, I, I've come back. My, my connections uh, let me down a bit. My apologies, Stephen. Thank you for that. I didn't catch all, 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 all of your contribution there. I think you're making the point that it's really a, a, a sort of governmental issue rather than directly a planning one. Um, just um, a, a further question we've got. I, I guess it goes very much to the heart of what we do as an organisation. Uh, and I suppose that, that's the question of uh, encouraging residents and councillors to support development rather than what's often seen as a NIMBY approach. And we've all seen it. I guess we've done it in our time as well. I certainly have. I must be honest about it. In the spirit of localism, recognising that development uh, needs to happen, uh, how can we make it work locally in a way that gets people involved, gets people uh, committed, uh, and as far as anyone's ever happy about development, gets people on board, if I can put it to you that way. Um, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Liz? Um, yes, I think it obviously comes down to consultation and doing consultation rather better than we've done it in the past. Um, one of the things that we would like to do in, in Oxfordshire is to review how we do that. Um, and it's really important that we not only, con I mean, some, some of the consulta consultations that we've done in the past have tended to be, um, for, for want of a better description, box ticking exercises, I think, particularly when it comes to infrastructure projects. Uh, um, and what that's resulted in is um, a number of people who felt that they haven't been listened to, but it's quite often hard to reach those people. So we have to look, I think, very innovatively about how we can contact people, how we can make sure that their views are heard. Um, I, I think going back to what's been said previously, one of the real issues is that I don't think people object to the idea of the right sorts of houses being built in their area. I think the problem is what that means in terms of the consequences when it comes to, for example, more cars on the road. Um, and we just haven't got the answer to that at the moment because infrastructure is being considered too late in the whole in the whole project. I mean, some of the some of the HIF money that's being spent is really only going to alleviate the problems that we already have on roads due to the number of people that are already living in the county. So we have to look forward at what new building is going to put onto those roads, which is why we're looking at things like rail. Going back to Cullum, um, you know, the, the, I know that there's, there's um, I, I think there's, there's discussion going on at the moment with, um, with Network Rail to increase the number of trains that stop at Cullum so that people can actually come from Oxford to Cullum on the train and go to work there. Um, and Cullum are really, really keen to make sure that that happens because the people that work in that industry, in the, in the fusion business there and in the other businesses that are growing up around that, are people who really want to change what goes on as far as um, the, the future of the planet is concerned. So having transport that fits for them is really, really important. But it's actually having the, the, the foresight to see what, that's, what the new homes are going to create and being able to express that to people in the areas where those homes are being built and being able to reassure them that actually we've got the infrastructure there that will make their lives easier as well as the lives of those people who are going to be moving into those houses. That's crucially important and just to extend that slightly when we were having a conversation about this across the arc the other day we were saying how important it is to make whatever development that happens in the arc acceptable people to people who are already living there i think this is absolutely crucial we've got to bring those people into the conversation explain explain to them why we are seeing more development uh, and make it possible for them to understand that we're not ignoring what are their current issues around transport and general infrastructure. And it's not just it's not just um, rail or road or cycle infrastructure. It's also about schools. It's also about doctors, surgeries, etc. We have to bring all those people into the conversation. 
Thanks for that, Liz. So infrastructure is the key, really, but people will essentially need to be engaged with and not feel done to, and so often they can in these sorts of situations. Any thoughts on the engagement side of things, community engagement, even the NAPFS has said a fair a bit about that, doesn't it? A good practice to share, possibly? Yes. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a heck of a lot of public consultation uh, in the planning process. Uh, there's the three rounds of consultation on uh, on development plans. You've got every planning application. There's a consultation. Um, I mean, sometimes local authorities don't handle that as well as they could do in terms of notifying uh, neighbours uh, as to what's going on. But I mean, certainly from our experience, uh, the public is very engaged, has been very engaged for many years in Oxfordshire in particular. Um, and I think taking respond to one of Liz's points, I think people do object to new development on, in, in their backyard, as it were, um, and would never get over that, but it is about making it as good as we can make it. Um, it is fair to say, though, however, that the, the biggest issue at every consultation event is always uh, infrastructure, and in, in particular, traffic generation. Uh, that's always the biggest issue. It's always the highway consultant that gets the, the hardest time at a, a public consultation event. And that again goes back to that where we started with that sort of public private sector partnership of trying to bring forward infrastructure in a in a timely and effective way. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for that. I, I, I've got another question. Much of our discussion so far has been very much about what we need from government in terms of funding for infrastructure, the green agenda, retrofitting, the rest of it. I'm very aware of the levelling up agenda, which we hear about a lot at the moment, uh, money heading north sort of thing. Is that, uh, how do you see that, uh, I suppose, uh, as being a, a county in the south of England, uh, Liz? And uh, I suppose, what can be done about that? I suppose it would be, would be my question to you. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, I mean, I think one of the things that um, we want to make sure happens in the county is that um, the businesses that we have there, um, the, the, the really important science businesses, the, the, the future business, the businesses of the future that we have around the county, um, can spread what they're doing to other parts of the country. And that is actually part of the intention. Um, the Oxford to Cambridge Arc is looking at that as a way of being able to um, level up, not just across the arc, but actually uh, with projects going out to other parts of the country as well. Um, so that is, a, that is a conversation that's in process. And I think that's really important. Um, leveling up isn't going to be just about, you know, building a railway line across the northern part of the country. It's going to be about bringing jobs to areas which don't have jobs at the moment, um, training people up, making it possible for people to work in a variety of different jobs that will contribute um, to our future. Um, and that, I think, is a really exciting prospect. Um, and that's very much a conversation that's going on at the moment. You know, how can the South actually help the North to level up and become part of the conversation? Thank you for that, Liz. I, I don't think you've got any thoughts on that. I, I, suppose, I suppose essentially it's political one, Stephen, but uh, as a planning professional, ha, 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 how do you see that question of leveling up and impact? I, I, well, it's out? interesting. We, we have offices in, in Birmingham and, uh, and, and Leeds and Bristol and Cambridge, and, and they're all very busy with new development proposals. I mean, Leeds um, uh, uh, stretches across from Yorkshire over to uh, the, Man the Manchester area, and there's a heck of a lot going on up there, actually. Uh, so I think things are starting to level up. Um, also, what's very, really interesting is the whole sort of post-COVID um, issue around where people will live. Um, I mean, we're, we're seeing signs, I mean, I'm doing a scheme up in Lincolnshire, uh, a potential housing scheme, where we've been trying to build it away for years, and all of a sudden, there's a lot of interest in developers because they are seeing a demand from people who, who who've have been working from home for a year and a half, uh, who've got employers that are more sympathetic to that and, and are prepared to let them work from home on a more regular basis. So they're looking north for much cheaper housing. Um, and if, if it's on a good transport link, uh, they can make it work. Uh, and I think that's going to be an interesting um, uh, matter going forward, I can see quite a sea change in in, in where people live and how, how they run their lives and that split between home and work. Uh, Liz, you you touched on the uh, Oxford to Cambridge arc a moment ago. Um, I, I just I've got a question here about the growth board. Um, 
Is it another talking shop rather than the body with real teeth and delivery? If I can be a bit provocative, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I've only been a member of the growth board for a couple of months, actually. Um, but I have to say that we are we do have quite a lot of interesting um, discussions around uh, particularly uh, things like the the 2050 plan that we're putting together uh, across the county. That's really that, that, that the discussions that we're having between the various districts and the county council on that is really important. Um, I think it it's it doesn't have teeth. We, we don't actually vote on anything very much. Um, in the sense that we, um, you know, we can't actually we can't actually legislate for things that happen in the county, um, but I think it is an opportunity for um, councils to get together and look at the things that we have in common and that we want to create in common, um, which it would be more difficult to do if we didn't have those conversations. Um, I think the main thing, the main thing to say, as I as I said earlier is that the, it started off really as you know, the growth deal and the fact that we were being offered money for infrastructure if we built houses, et cetera. Um, it, it's really moved on from that because all the local plans are now in place. Um, we're looking forward to 2050, as I said, but our focus is very much now on how can we make Oxfordshire as a whole a greener, fairer place for people to live. Um, and how can we together as, as, as a group of councils um, aim, um, create our, our objectives and, and, and work towards those objectives? I think it, it's, it's important to do it. Um, but at the end of the day, the responsibility for planning, the responsibility for in, infrastructure does lie with those separate councils. Uh, thank you for that. Is it any thoughts on, 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 on the board and the art board, Stephen? Uh, well, in answer to the, your, the question you asked, in my view, yes, the growth board is a talking shop. Um, I think there are more effective ways of, uh, of, of, of being joined up. Um, I think it's a layer, a layer of administration, if it is administration, that we can that we can do without. Personally, sorry, Liz. Fine. <laughs> no, I, I, I feel I have to be quite careful what I say here because, you know, as a new person on the growth board, um, but I actually think that there's a, a lot of that going on. I mean, my experience in the last couple of months has been that, it, well, I mean, we have the LEP as well, and the very same things are discussed by the same group of people in different meetings with different titles. So I absolutely do agree yeah. with you, Stephen, on that. I think there's far too much of that going on. And I, I, I'm probably rather more critical of the LEP than I am of the Growth Board on that, because the LEP includes a, a, a wider group of people who then get involved in all sorts of other things. And again, the LEP doesn't really have much that it can, that it can do. Um, it, it, but, but you need to have those conversations, because without those conversations, um, we'll all be going in different directions, so it's keeping them to a minimum, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're beginning to run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, uh, I've got a question for each of you, I guess, from your different perspectives. Um, uh, one for Stephen. Um, yours, yours is what would your one wish be for the county to do, what would you like from the county? And for Liz, your question, what would you like developers to do? Uh, What's your one ask if you if you can put it that way? Can I start with Stephen first? If that's okay. Uh, I'd like them to get the Oxfordshire mobility model up and working as quickly as possible because that is holding back uh, development, um, particularly at Dalton Barracks, but other strategic sites through the Vale and South Oxfordshire. Uh, and that's a very parochial sort of comment uh, in terms of what I'm involved in currently. Um, I think, but it just slightly more generally, um, the county council, from a planning perspective, its main its main remit is, is around um, transport and education. Um, they've got a very important role to play. Like all authorities, they're under-resourced. Um, uh, so I'd like them to have more resource to, to build on the great work that the teams within the county council transport team, tra transport section have, uh, uh, but they just need more people, more resource. Sorry, Philip, you broke up slightly and okay, you asked the, the question. Quick, Could you ask it again? I will happily do so. What would you like uh, developers to do? What, what would you ask, ask of them? Right. OK. Um, well, I think the first thing I would like developers to do is to... Is to uh, I think the main thing for me is where do we provide affordable homes and how do we do that most effectively in partnership with developers? Yes, we are asking developers to put affordable homes onto all the sites that they develop, 
Um, it, it depends where you are and what the percentage is, but it's a fairly high percentage. But I really would like to see more, I suppose, more um, imaginative ways of, of providing affordable housing, um, and particularly in the city, which does and, and avoiding the green belt. Um, so brownfield sites, for example, in the city, that would take a great deal of pressure off some of the green fields across the rest of Oxfordshire. So I'd like a lot more imagination to go into um, both the city council and developers in the city looking at ways in which they can provide affordable housing there. Liz, there. With regard to Oxford, uh, it's finding enough brownfield land on which to build. Uh, that, that's the biggest issue. Uh, and to do to do that at any scale, you have to go high. Then you're into a whole other kind of worms regarding uh, heritage and the importance of, uh, of the views in and out of the city. Um, and there's also, I think, just you know, uh, trying to cram too much into the city and ch changing its character uh, and losing its its, its special um, historic resonance. So I think that that's a that's a tricky one. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that. Oxford has the capacity for a very significant amount of, of uh, brownfield development. Um, well, I think there is a discussion about whether you know they should be using the, the brownfield sites they've got to develop businesses or to, or to develop housing to you know to, to, to provide housing for people already in the city. I think there is a big debate around that, um, and 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 it's a debate we haven't yet finished. Yeah, no, agreed. Indeed, and I suppose right on cue, that brings us just about to the end of our time. We were never going to uh, put, uh, put all these things to bed in, in the course of one hour, but uh, I must say we've had a fascinating discussion, highly instructive. I certainly learned a great deal just coming from another local authority, never mind working with Kirsten and Kirk. So, um, uh, Liz and Stephen, I would like to thank you um, very much indeed for your contributions today. It's been absolutely first class, uh, very thought provoking. Um, I'd like to thank our wider audience too who have tuned in. We've done our best to cover your questions. Apologies if there were one or two we didn't quite manage to get to, but nevertheless, we do appreciate that. Uh, no doubt we will come back to this in the future. There's plenty more to talk about. And I know I, for one, and I'm sure the rest of us will take a very keen interest in things as they develop in the county of Oxford moving forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Liz and Stephen. Liz, very best of luck in your new role. And no doubt I'll pass across again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, thank you for me too. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you.